So I'm Jamie Dubose. This is my first year, but I'm actually a sophomore because of how my credits worked out from high school. And I'm a major in communications. Cool. Um, so I know you went to Sierra Canyon, a private school here in the Valley. Um, are there any similarities or differences um, transitioning to USC? Honestly, I feel like USC is just Sierra Canyon with like more people. I don't know, because you went to Sierra, so I don't know if you agree, but it's like the athletic people are like pretty much the same. It's like athletics are like kind of what the school I feel like focuses on a lot, but it's still like strong academically. And I feel like the diversity, I feel like is pretty similar. I've only been online, but it's like from what I could tell and like being on campus when I can, it seems very similar. Yeah, so you talked about being online now and I know you're a sophomore, but you're also a freshman. So this is your first year. Like, how was that transition of being a college student, but COVID hit? Honestly, it was really difficult because it's hard to stay motivated online for me personally, because it feels very optional when everything's on Zoom, but it's definitely not. So it's hard to stay motivated in an environment that doesn't feel like a class or a college especially going from high school where like you can get away with like not turning in assignments and your grade will be fine. Like here, if you don't turn in an essay, you're done. Like you yeah. are screwed. So it's been hard, but I kind of like how flexible it is with my schedule. <coughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you can do other you things. I think the workload was harder though, because of the expectation of, you know, we're all going through this. It, I felt like they were trying to ease up, but then again, it, they kind of just made everything harder. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely feel like the no spring break has been killing me this semester because we haven't had a break. And I know my friends have said the same thing. And yeah, the workload, like they give us, I feel like the answers pretty easily in like lectures, but it's still hard to like put all of it together in tests or in essays and stuff. Yeah. So um, <coughs> what are you hoping will change throughout your college experience? You know, because you're online like do you have fear of missing out on certain things oh a hundred percent like i i remember you were on campus and i would look at your stories and be like dang i can't wait to be on campus how fun like cam is and like now we're online and like i have maybe like one friend really from school and like i'm terrified to go back on campus even though i really want to because i don't remember what it's like to be in a classroom and like have to be around right. people i don't know um, so I definitely do want to be on campus, but I'm also really nervous for that change. Yeah. Um, what about like organizations or like certain events where you looking forward to? Because I feel like especially as a black student, it's like, you know, you're not really a majority on campus. So it's like, how do you get yourself involved? I joined BSA, I think that's called the Black Student Association, like online. Haven't been to any of the events, to be honest, but like I'm a part of the organization. So when I get yeah. back on campus, I'm gonna try to get a part of that. I know you want me to say I wanna be in a sorority, but I really don't wanna be in a sorority. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but no, I definitely think like I'm gonna try to join just clubs to get out there. Can you stop? I'm trying to answer. <laughs> oh, I wanna be in like organizations like BSA and maybe find some other ones to like just meet people because it's so hard online. Right. Right. Maybe a sorority eventually. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> um, what about support from the school? Like, how do you think they've handled this situation or just from what you're seeing? I, I mean, we had so many scandals this past year. Um, we had a building shut down because um, of its eugenics kind of um, ideologies. And then we had student led protests going on. Um, in the wake of like Black Lives Matter and George Floyd. Like, what are you thinking about all of this? Um, how USC's dealt with it? Honestly, I didn't even know about the building. So now I feel really disconnected from USC. I think just being a first year and being online. Um, but now that I know that, I definitely feel like USC probably could do a little bit better in supporting the students because I understand like their mentality, like I said, with the spring break and just kind of being like, just push through the semester. But I feel like with everyone, even professors kind of complaining, like, we need a break. This is COVID. Like, people aren't really there mentally. You know, people are feeling down. So I think if USC really took, because I know they're doing mental health days, but I feel like they could probably do a little bit more and be a little, little bit more lenient on students and professors to kind of work together instead of just 
trying to make it as normal as possible in a situation that no one prepared for. Right. And I feel like wellness days aren't even really wellness because we're still doing homework. Right. You know, we're still yeah. stressed. Like one day isn't anything really. It's yeah. just a catch up day. Literally, <laughs> that's how I've used all my wellness days is like having an assignment due the next day, like catching up. I have not feel like I take a break this semester. Right. Right. It's nonstop. And like from your Instagram too, like I've noticed you've post a lot of more like mental health um, kind of themed um you know, quotes or videos, like what is your take on, on mental health as a college student and being that type of advocate now? I think for me, like there was a point in my life where my mental health was just so horrible and I really had to teach myself how to get out of it. So in my opinion, I was kind of like, I want to take what I've learned and kind of share it with other people, hopefully to help just one person. If anything I post, say, or do just re reaches one person and helps them, like that's more than enough for me. So that's kind of where I come from. And especially now, like we talked about these mental health days aren't even really mental health days. And I feel like USC doesn't really dive into how a pandemic on top of a college student and like sitting in front of a computer affects someone's mental health negatively. So just as a student, I kind of am trying to teach others, like it's okay to be like, listen, I need a break. I cannot do this essay. I can't do this right now. All right. Well, speaking of your platform, um... Can you talk about some of the other things you've been doing to stay productive? I know you're in a quite a few uh, different projects right now, so. Yeah, a lot. Um, okay, so first and foremost, I am on a talk show called The Mix on Fox Soul with four of the co-hosts, um, Romeo Miller, Zanique, Anton Peoples, and Jazz Anderson. It's really cool. Um, it's like a millennial Gen Z talk show, which is fun. Um, I also have a makeup line that I'm working on, Dulé Cosmetics with my makeup artist. What else am I doing? Oh, I'm writing a book um, <laughs> about, <laughs> about being um, a Black girl in private and independent schools, which Cameron, I was going to ask you to be part of oh, anyway, wow. so it was perfect timing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm working on that. Obviously, always trying to get, you know, social media numbers up, working on brand deals. I think that's it i covered it all you just got your first brand deal yeah i did get my first brand deal with celsius so that's really cool i'm excited for that so yeah I, that's pretty much what i do alongside school <laughs> yeah so to backtrack on the mix like how do you get into that i mean you're the youngest um host too so it's like how do you deal with that pressure especially working with people who already have their foot in the door so to say like how do you break through that and yeah, make a name for yourself. Honestly, um, I really want to say like it's support from like everyone on the show. They've been so nice to me, but also I feel like my mom has been a big help because she's been reaching out to people. And I think it's just kind of in myself because this is what I like to do. I like being on the talk show. And so, I mean, obviously it's kind of hard to like carve out a name when it's like, oh, Romeo said this, or like Zonique said this. Right. But, you know, I just try to stay like true to myself. And like I said before, I just kind of hope like one person here's what I say. And they're like, oh, I, I kind of agree with her. Like, I kind of, you know, like her views, like her ideals. So I think that's kind of just the route I've been going is like on my own, but also like taking in support from like my co-hosts. And your producers. And my producers. <laughs> can't forget them. And also too, like you have family ties in the industry. Like how, yeah. you know, again, like with making a name for yourself, like how do you try to distinguish yourself from, you know, you? the already like family influence in the industry? I think it's funny because when people meet like my family, like for instance, my dad, um, they're always like, you're nothing like him. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm really not. And so I think that honestly alone helps just kind of having very different personalities and mindsets. I think just alone when people meet me, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, you're his daughter, but you're not like him. So right. that really does help a lot, just kind of being my own person and going down my own path. Right. But but that but but being like him has nothing to do with it. I think you kind of missed that question. Like like you know how the other uh, hosts are kind of like celebrity kids. Yeah. You know, it's like I, I'm kind of wondering like how do you uh, deal with that kind of holding up to that standard, like breaking from who the parent is. You know, like distinguishing what they've already done and how are you going to be different you know in a sense well it's, it's actually the same because all the hosts on the show everybody's family is in the entertainment business. right 
Right. So there's not much deviation from family lineage because you just kind of fall into it. But in Jamie's case, she was asked to be a host on the show because of COVID on a different show actually. And she had done so well on that interview. One of the producers saw her not knowing who she was, just saw a snippet uh, of, the, of the interview. And it asked if this kid who came across really well would be interested in auditioning for a millennial show that they had. So oh unbeknown, un, unbeknown to even her dad, he, had, yeah. he didn't know <laughs> that, is that they had inquired about Jamie. And that producer didn't know that Jamie was James's daughter. Right. That's, and that's, that's and just all world. Eventually it all came together, right? But she went on the audition and she really got the show by herself on her own merit. It was coincidental. Yeah. To be quite honest. And those are the best because it's like you really earn that. And and yeah. that's where I think you get to differentiate yourself and um, you know, from family members who are already in a certain business and you know. Yeah. And like my dad has always been like behind the camera too. So it's like we're already doing different things. Mm-hmm. Like I'm in front, he's behind. So I think right. that will help like differentiating the names. Um, yeah. So so you having something to do with your dad or being different from him has nothing to do well, with yeah, that. I am. Just if you're ever asked that question in the future. You kind of <laughs> like Sometimes I wanna okay. No, she's learning. You know, it's like she's 19. It's a learning curve, right? right. You can't take all that experience. And, and, and just boom, there it is in your brain, you know? Right. Because I mean, like, even for Romeo, you have to think like him and his dad, like, yeah, they're the Millers, but they are so different, you know? So like, even if you were to ask him, like, you know, it, it's hard because everyone knew him at one point as, you know, his son, but he's done so many projects now that he's just in his own kind of, platform, you know? Yeah. And the big difference in the show too is everybody is a singer or a rapper. Yeah, except and, for me. And Jamie, <laughs> Jamie doesn't bring that. She's, you know, Lil Romeo, Romeo is an actor and he's a rapper. Right. So from Lil Romeo to Romeo, Jazz is a rapper. Zonique, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Zonique has been in the music business since she was two. Like right. you know, her mom was promoting her like when she was five. Like they're right. doing the other little girl, Eris. So they all have a definite music background, some crossover in the television, definitely Romeo crossover in the film. And you don't have that. No, I do not. So (laughs) you carving out your own space is truly unique and different. And their parents are in front of the camera, including Jazz. You know, her dad played in the NBA, but her mom is Tammy. So you're the only one that doesn't have a parent that has visual in the entertainment business. So you really have to carve out your own. True. Yeah. Yeah, that's good you though. For me, your answers are better than mine. You're learning. <laughs> you're learning. You're learning. That's how you learn. So you talked about too how you're a young entrepreneur um, and you have a makeup line. Um, what is the meaning of of the name? Because I'm not really sure. And then <laughs> what is like what does it signify for you to be in the cosmetic type lines? Well, okay, the first question, the name, it's actually my last name, Dubose, and then um, my makeup artist's first name, Leticia, just like together. Mm-hmm. And, like Lay is like Leticia, and then Du is Dubose, and we just kind of put it together. So that's how the name came about. Um, but the reason I got in cosmetics was because when I was in middle school, I used makeup to just kind of make myself feel better, just kind of put a little extra me time into my mornings before I go to school or like, you know, cover acne. And just as I grew up, makeup just always became something I loved. And it became kind of like a therapy for me, a time where I could just sit down and like focus on myself for a little bit. And it just became like a passion of mine, just learning. And I'm still learning how to do makeup. I definitely am not the best at it, but I thought making this line, it just kind of like fueled something I wanted to do, which was dive in cosmetics and kind of be able to have my own product that I can use on myself every day. Right. And like with exclusivity, like what are your plans on, you know, certain shades or things like that? Because I feel like the makeup industry in itself could be very divisive where, you know, a lot of black and brown girls can't find, you know, certain shades or they just don't feel included. 
um, into something that's supposed to make everyone feel good about themselves. Right. So something we talked about was like, we don't want to put out any like foundation or concealer until we're able to make shades like a very wide shade range. So everyone kind of like what Rihanna did. So everyone can find their own shade. Can you stop? And I, you know, it's like people rush because they have a product idea. But I think for us, we really want to take our time and make sure, like you said, Cameron, everyone feels included because that's what this makeup brand is about. It doesn't matter your skin tone, texture, whatever. Like everyone should feel beautiful in the makeup they wear if they choose to wear it. So right now we're focusing on a lot of eye products like eyeliners and eyeshadows, lashes, but we are working on foundations and concealers, just making sure we have a significant shade range to Yay. put out. Well, I'm excited because I mean, I look at all your Instagram makeup, like for inspos, like it's <laughs> long, like you always look good before you go on set. Like, like, yeah, I'm just happy for you because you look good. You're doing good. Oh, thank you. Right now I look like I just, <laughs> but I just went to the gym, but no, I really do appreciate it. And I tell you all the time, I always tell everyone, I'm like, Cameron, I look up to her. Like, Aww. ever since we were little, I feel like you know this too. Like, I'm always like, I want to look like Cameron. I want to be like Cameron. Like, because no. you're just such a driven person. And you're just a good person from like the inside out. So I feel like you have been a role model to me for forever. So it's like crazy for me to hear that you look at what I do and like you're proud of me. Like, it actually does mean a yeah. lot to me. Yeah. And I feel like, I don't know, like when you see people doing good and makes you want to do good and it's like it's always good to have and just know that people support you and I and I'm really excited for your career because you know I know it, it took a lot for you to get to where you are and like this is only the beginning too so it's just crazy that you're juggling school and doing this a global pandemic racial injustice and you're still like you know putting yourself out there. I feel like a lot of people during this time have kind of shut down and felt like their career isn't going anywhere. And like you did the exact opposite and yeah. just went for it. Like <laughs> that's all you could really do. Like you just have to put yourself out there and like- you have to take risks and just be like, you know what? If Even if it doesn't work out, I tried. And that's kind of what we've been talking about a lot. It's just like, just try it. And if it doesn't work out, oh well, you put your effort into it, you put your all, you could just be proud of that at the end of the day. Right. And then, so what about your book? Like, what are your um, kind of goals for your book or things that we could look out for? So the goal of the book basically is just to give like the real version of what it's like being a black person in private and independent schools because people see like black girls and black boys like, oh, you're whitewashed because you went to a private school when it's mm -hmm. like half the time they don't even value our opinions. They don't hear us. They always belittle our existence on campus just because of our skin colors. They're like, well, you're black. So you just must be an athlete for the school. Like that's all you have to give. And so I just kind of wanted to educate parents and teachers and even kids who are in that system. Like, A, you're not alone. B, like what you're going through is completely normal. I went through it, but also it will make you a better person. It will make you a stronger person in the end because people who who aren't aware of like racial injustice and don't know how to deal with it are put into the real world and they're kind of like oh gosh like what do I do but I feel like for you and I like you know you're doing this black excellence thing which is amazing because you know what it's like to be a black person in a private school and not feel heard and so right. I think it's amazing like you could take that into your career into your professional life and know how to you know make your way to the top because you already know how to deal with people like that right and it's hard too because I feel like we keep putting ourselves, not putting ourselves, but we're in these spaces to educate people. And it's kind of like a double-edged sword because who else is better to tell these stories than us? But then again, it's like, we also have this responsibility to educate white peers when they themselves should educate themselves, you know, so. Exactly. And you guys are in a pretty unique situation because number one, a person, a kid in public school or any kid in America would look at you, any small town USA would say, what are they complaining for? They're in private schools. Right. Yeah. They're black. How, mm. how, how ungrateful are mm. they? Right. Mm. How could they find anything wrong in the situation that they're in? And, and so you are in this boat by yourself because you're right most of USA doesn't relate to you, but number two, you're still in this boat by yourself. So you're feeling this rejection or you're feeling this, 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 um, 
uh, what's the word, intoxication from your own race because you're in this privileged situation right. that's supposed to be okay and it's just not. So I, I think you guys both have to navigate that you're still included with your community and that you too have struggles and where you are and you weren't asked to to have this quote unquote privilege that you have, but you got to figure out how to fucking navigate it. Right. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, it, it is an interesting place to be because we have these intersectional identities. One, we're Black. Two, we're Black women. Um, three, we're trying to be Black women in the entertainment business, which has its own kind of you know, diversity type issues. And then three and four, sorry, we're educated. So we're in these predominantly white institutions and we find ourselves being, you know, I mean, USC, it's only 5.5%. So how much of that is taking out from athletics exactly. and then right. the programs we're in, the gender we are? Like, I really wonder like how many of us, like me and you, there really is. And it's- Oh yeah. It's sad. I mean, that's, that's a great question, Cam, to pose to administration. Of the 5.5% of African-American kids that are at USC, what percentage of that are athletes? That's all you wanna know. Right. And then isolate that. And then you're just talking real students. Right. Right. And I'm sure that number's got to be really small because if you look at USC sports, it's predominantly black. Oh, right. of course. That's, that's kind of what I was tackling in my book because like I didn't play sports in high school. Every sport I did was like outside of school. So I was just a student. So I didn't get the same benefits like, you know, the basketball team got or like, you know, any other like athlete, basketball, volleyball, soccer, like I was just a black student, no sports. Like how was I treated you know, in school. And again, it's very like, I'm appreciative that I could have gone to Sierra Canyon and that I'm at USC, but it's like, there's still issues, like no matter where I go. And if anything, like I'm not complaining and you're not complaining, we're just educating people. Right. And people seem to take, when a black person speaks on their experience, it's always like, oh, they're complaining. Like, why can't you ever just like be happy with what you have? Like, and it's like, well, we're happy, we're grateful, but we're still here to educate because things can get better. No matter how far they've gotten, we could be appreciating how far we got, but there's still, you know, some places we need to go. We need to be. Right. And that's where me and you are trying to get people. We're trying to elevate their way of thinking so they truly understand, you know, yeah, sure, slavery's over. Yes, you know, we have the Civil Rights Act, but there's still legislation that needs to happen. Like with George Floyd, police brutality, that's a huge thing right now. You're trying to change the scales of equity. And right. That, and that's the issue. It's like, yes, we made it, but you don't even understand the caliber of what of how we had to work to right. get to where you already were. And exactly. it's like, you know, we could be smarter than you. We, you know what I'm saying? We could be top of our class, but but just for us to get noticed took way more energy than exactly. it did for you. That's why I was the like, I, even, of equity. I already wrote Cameron right down. down. I wrote Cameron mm -hmm. and people I want to interview already. So of I equity. I like that. Damn, I'm brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that up. Skills of equity. That was me. It's true because it's like, why? <laughs> you thought you said, me? I'm brilliant. I have to work this hard. <laughs> no, but that's a good point. I That is very true. Because it's like, I feel like a lot of probably the white students who, who got into USC, I mean, they're 29.6% of USC. And then the international is 22%. And then compared to other, the other category is 8.9%. Uh, and then we're 5.5%. So even compared to the other category, whatever that means, whatever it means. we're still the minority. Like that is effing ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I feel like the white peers, it's more so getting in through connections. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's because of how elite and prestige SC is. And it's kind of like you, like you have to know somebody to be mm -hmm. in there, but it's like, why does it feel like all the black people I meet are freaking brilliant? And it's like the white people I meet, you know, like it's just They're a different party. vibe. It's like yeah. typical white people I met in the Valley. And it's like the black people I meet are freaking aerospace engineers, uh, have several different gigs they're doing. Um, they're planning all these events at USC. And it's like, why do we have to go above and beyond to get here? Exactly. 